sits on heaven's mercy seat. Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty, who was and this and this to come. With all creation I sing praise to the King of Kings. Good morning. Welcome to uh, Over Isle Reformed Church. If you're visiting us today, thanks for uh, giving us a shot. For those who are at home or on online looking at us, uh, wish you could be here, but glad that you're watching. And for those of us who are here today in person, it kind of reminds me what it must be like for God um, when His people come and gather together. I remember my mom's got a pretty big family. She's the baby of nine. Her mom is the baby of nine, you know, good Dutch folks and um, creating more Christian Reformed people at that point. And we would have Thanksgiving over at my aunt and uncle's house in Southern California, and there'd usually be a low year would be 30 people. That, like, that'd be almost nobody was there. And a high year could have been friends and significant others and cousins from Montana, and there could be 60, 70 people there. And it just felt right to gather at Uncle Maury and Aunt Angie's house together. You know, it, or it's like when you have people coming, you know, the family's home at, at, at Christmas, or I, I think it feels that way for God. Like, not everybody's home, but the family's gathered this morning. They're around the table. When we have communion, like last week, we're around the table. The people of God are together again, and that's just right. So welcome. God welcomes you here this morning. God is happy that we're his people and we're connected together in this way. Um, just a couple announcements before we go on. Pastor Mike is at Central Park Chapel this morning, so when we sing a couple of songs in a few minutes, you still have time to get there if you want. Um, you know, I won't take offense, it's okay. Um, but tonight at 4 o'clock, there is my, Pastor Mike's ordination 
service. So there is no evening worship at 5, it's at 4, and we'll be uh, ordaining and installing him as our senior pastor here at Overiasel Reformed Church. For those of you who want to watch it, it'll also be live streamed online today as well. So if you could stand a moment. Grace, mercy, and peace to all of you in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, who welcomes you in, who opens our eyes and our hearts to be with him here in this place today. Take a moment to greet each other, and then we'll start uh, some worship time. of the king.
seated. Unless you are a child, then we invite you to come on down for the children's message. Good morning. We got a small crowd this morning. <laughs> I'm going to tell you guys a little story this morning, okay? There once was a giant ship out on the ocean. And the captain of this ship looked out into the distance and he could see lights. And they looked like they were getting closer. So he decided to send a message to this other approaching ship. And he said, you need to change your course 10 degrees to the south. So he wanted this other ship to go around him, okay? And he waited, and soon a message came back. And the man on the other, on the other end said, no, you need to change your course 10 degrees to the north. So he was telling this mighty captain of this giant ship to change his direction. And that made this captain angry. And he said, well, no, I'm a captain. You can't tell me what to do. So he got back on the radio, and he told this other approaching ship, no, you need to change your course 10 degrees to the south. I am a captain. Soon another reply came back, and the man on the other end said, no, you need to change your course 10 degrees to the north. I am First Seaman Jones. Again, the captain was angry. He said, well, I'll show him. I'm the captain of a mighty battleship. So he got back on the radio and he said, no, you need to change your course 10 degrees to the south. I am the captain of a mighty battleship. So a battleship has weapons and he's big and powerful, right? And the captain waited. Soon a reply came back and the man on the other end said, you must change your course 10 degrees to the north. I am a lighthouse. So the captain of this big, giant, powerful battleship wanted to stay going the same direction he had been going. He thought everything was just fine. But this lighthouse was guiding him. He wanted to help him save him from crashing into the land and causing damage to his ship or maybe even to harming people. Sometimes we're like the captain of that ship. We think everything's going just fine. We don't need to do anything different. But we have a lighthouse too. Did you guys know that we have a lighthouse in our lives? Any idea who that might be? It's God. God wants to help us. He's always there to guide us and show us the right way that we should go. And sometimes we don't listen right away. And he puts people in our lives like Pastor Ty or Pastor Mike or our Sunday school teachers and maybe even our friends to help us, to guide us when we're not going the right direction. All right. Thanks for listening to my story. You guys go back to your seats. You thought it was a small group, Holly, but then they kept coming and they come in and some of them were hiding in the back and crawling back to mom and thank you for that message. Um, we're done. That's what I wanted to talk about this morning. Well done. Um, as we go to God in prayer this morning, we continue to look around at the world around us. Um, the beauty and the joy, I think, God willing, some of the weather broke in the last last evening after dinner. All of a sudden, out by the house, all of a sudden it felt like, oh, 
This is actually, some of the humidity broke, the clouds went away. Today looks like a beautiful day. We'll pray for our neighbors next to us. They're having uh, outdoor services at uh, ORC, RC, this morning. Um, pray for Pastor Mike and Gina. They'll be on vacation next week, and for him delivering the message this morning at Central Park Chapel. Um, pray to thank the Lord for a great week of VBS. Um, there were ballpark 80 plus kids here, right? Um, and we figured it out, and it was probably almost two thirds kids not from our congregation and a third. So we had roughly 30 kids from ORC, and then the other 50 to 60 were from other churches. So what a great opportunity for outreach and loving and caring for the community around us. Um, we look around on the world stage and uh, things going on in places like Cuba where people are standing up and saying, we want to be free. Um, may the church there be blessed. May the church there um, be a safe place for people to come. May those who have lived under oppression for a very, very long time be able to stand up and say not only freedom, but freedom in Christ. And uh, so let's turn to our Lord in prayer this morning. God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, we thank you for another day of breath and of life. Whether we struggle for that breath, whether we're not sure what life looks like for us today, whether we know where we're going and what we're doing and, and have devoted ourselves to you, Lord, whatever life brings us today, help us to be aware of where you're leading and guiding and calling, and that is. Lord, as we love family and friends, as we engage in the community, help all the routines of our lives be honoring and pleasing unto you. Um, whether it's how we drive or speak to somebody, whether it's how we relax in our own homes with our families and friends, whether it's if we're out and about, Lord, help us to be a visible sign and reminder of your goodness on this earth. You created this earth. You made it. You spoke it into existence and all the wonderful diversity of life and plants and animals and stars and sunsets and the beauty in this world. Help us to show your kingdom because that's what your plan was. You left generation after generation the ability to be like you and that's what we ask for, Lord. For those who are sick and ill and shut in and wondering and questioning and not knowing what way is up, Lord, may not just their caregivers, may not just the folks that are doctors and nurses and people in the hospital and others be a light. Let us also be that light in our church. Let us look to the shut-in. Let us look to those who are homeward bound. Let us look to those who are ill. Let us be a family to each other. Bless all the churches that are, are preaching your word today, whether it's a large cathedral somewhere in this world or two or three gathered in a back room in a house in a place that does not allow worship. May your word be presented. May it, may it just be refreshing. May it give hope and encouragement when times are dark. And may it spur us on when things are going well to even be more connected and closely related to you. Lord, be with all the crises that are in the earth. We think of most notably right now what's going on in Cuba. May your peace reign. May your people stand up. Um, and maybe it won't affect change on a political scale. But if your Christians there are bold and courageous and know that you walk with them, they can be a hope and a healing and a shelter to those who do not know and for those who might be being persecuted right now. Lord, may your church thrive and prosper in this and may your will be done. Lord, as we go from this place today, help us to realize that we bring you. We are a small, pale light, but we are not invaluable because you go with us. You go before us and above us, beyond us and behind us. You are our God and allow us to be your people in this day. In the name of Christ we pray. Amen. So now I have an opportunity to stand and sing. Um, take my life and let it be. It's noted in the bulletin what verses that'll be. One, two, five, and six. Take my life.
You may be seated. Uh, if you want to get your Bible out or Pew Bible out, it's uh, page 980 in the Pew Bible. It's Philippians 1, chapter 2. Um, we'll be going through verse 8. I made a typo there, not 16. So Philippians chapter 2, verses 1 through 8 is where we're going. And Holly, as you were talking there this morning, it reminded me of something. You know, you've got this big, powerful captain, do it my way. And then you've got the lighthouse kind of going, hey, I kind of know what's going on. And it reminds me of something growing up with our kids. Um, and if you have any little ones connected in your life, your own kids, friends, kids, whatever, you understand the phrase, I do it. I do it. You heard it maybe said different ways. Kevin, you get the glory of this coming up soon enough. Um, when they can walk and talk and then they say, I do it. That's kind of where we're going this morning. I do it. And the whole point behind I do it is, is it submission or is it rebellion? And this morning we're talking about the idea of being trapped and trying to be our own God. When we tell God, I do it. And God, like we do as parents or uh, people who know little ones, just kind of go, oh, dear little one, if you only knew. If you only understood. You know, and, and it's not just a little kid phenomenon, is it? It's also an us phenomenon. It's a human phenomenon. It's a, it's a thing that we see in our siblings, you know. We, we see in ourselves. I remember, you know, with my sister and I, how bad can I be to still be under the radar where my sister, you know, we all go through times in our lives, right, when, when how can I be less bad than the naughty kid in the family so that they don't notice me? You know, and there was a season I was that kid, and my sister could fly between the radar, but about 15 or 16, when, and maybe it's a younger age now, but when moms and daughters tend to, it's like, I'm golden. But I wasn't making golden choices. So we're going to talk about this morning. So if you have your Bible, Um, here's what it says in Philippians 2, 1 through 8. If you have any encouragement from being united with Christ, if any comfort from his love, if any fellowship with the Spirit, if any tenderness and compassion, then make my joy complete by being like-minded, having the same love, being one in spirit and purpose. Do nothing out of selfish ambition or vain conceit. That's the, I think I'm better than everybody else part. But in humility, consider others better than yourselves. Each of you should look not only to their own interests, but also to the interests of others. And then here's the part we're going to kind of look at a little bit more this morning. Your attitude should be the same as that of Jesus Christ, who being in very nature God. So what it said, who is God? Jesus Christ is God. There's no, here's Jesus and here's God. Holy Spirit goes on that too. So who, being God, did not consider being equal with God something to be grasped, held on to, clung to, but made himself nothing, taking the very nature of a servant, being made in human likeness, and being found in, his, in appearance as a man. He humbled himself and became obedient to death, even death on a cross. So my first question this morning is, how often... Do we realize we are trapped and caught in the things that we want, appreciate, love, desire, and are selfish about in life? Because it tends not to be something we think about too often. I had a friend years ago, um, back before I lived in Michigan, that the things of his life would regularly catch up to him. And unfortunately, those things in his life were pretty big things. It was a heroin addiction and an alcohol addiction. And he had to call me from jail. He had got picked up, got thrown into jail and would be there for a while. He wouldn't be home for a while. He was a roommate of mine. Godly man, loved him dearly, still do. Still keep in touch a little bit. But, you know, he understood his freedom was gone when he was being led away from a drunk driving charge with also drugs in his system 
on the way to jail in handcuffs in the back of a police cruiser. All of a sudden you realize, "Uh uh-oh, I'm trapped. Even though he was trapped before the police officer rolled up, all of a sudden he realized he was trapped. Same goes for, you know, I think you guys, Chris and Christy and others that love dogs and care for dogs, you have a dog off-leash doing what it wants, and then when the leash comes out, unless that dog's been very well trained, it's like, oh, no, 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 no. I don't want to be on a leash. I'm not going this way. You know, all of a sudden, that dog that thought it had freedom, all of a sudden, especially if you're using a training choker and chain, come here. It knows it just lost its freedom. Or think about children and little ones, whether they're your own children or somebody you know. Um, I saw this with my nieces, and then I saw it again with my own children. They're running, they're playing, they're having a good time, but when bedtime comes, they realize you're starting to put them into that crib or you're starting to put them during the day into that pack and play or some other confinement. It's like, oh, no, 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 no. The freedom they thought they had, which they really didn't if, as loving parent parents and aunts, uncles, and friends, you know, you're still watching. You're still not letting them do whatever they want. But when all of a sudden that freedom gets lost, the ability to do what I want, when I want, how I want, goes away, all of a sudden it's like, oh, I don't know if I like this. It is that much different in our Christian lives. When all of a sudden we realize that the things that we do, the things that we say, aren't really the path to freedom, that's when we kind of balk and, and like, I don't, I don't know this about Sorry, let me rephrase that. I don't think I like this. I don't want to be a part of this. I don't want to go this way. I want to do what I want to do, how I want to do it. Um, But in many things in our lives, it takes us a while to remember we're captive, right? To realize we're captive. Because at some point, we gave something permission in our lives, right? Yeah, I've said this before. You've heard me say this before. Nobody wakes up in the morning and goes, alcoholic? I can't wait. I'm looking forward to that. I want to be an alcoholic, you know? Nobody wakes up in the morning and says, you know what, I want to go to prison because I, 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 I want to embezzle all that money. It's a dollar here, it's 50 cents there that nobody, nobody talked to me about it, nobody caught me. It's all those different, nobody wakes up in the morning and says, I don't want to have control. And so I'll start this little thing that will go out of control in my life. That's not what happens. But we build these beautiful cages in our lives that we think are wonderful because we start thinking it's all about me, right? We have this tendency as humanity, same sin as Satan started with. Satan kept looking at, at God going, well, he's, he's pretty good, but I'm not all bad. I'm pretty nice. You know, my, my thought was at one point Satan's sitting down here in the choir, you know, and he's, he's first chair, let's say, in the heavenly orchestra. He's, he's one of the, the, the named um, angels. So he's, 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 you know, first, first level guy, but eventually he starts seeing it's like, I could, God, I could do that. I got strength. I got power. I got ability. So eventually Satan's like the kid at the preschool, like, look at me, you know, at the Christmas program. Look at, like, I'm pretty good too. And so we build these little cages. We build this persona around us that is like, but what about me? What about my desires? What about what I want? What about me being first? What about getting my just rewards, my, my dessert, do desserts, whatever you want to call it? And so we build these little worlds in our head that say, that's not so bad, or I could do better, or do I really have to listen to that? Do I really have to go down that path? And it, it's this thing where we get trapped by our own devices. What I'm talking about this morning is the idea of we put ourselves in the place of God. We think we know better. We think we can do better. We think we're just as good. We think all paths lead to a good place. We think our intelligence and wisdom is the same level as God. 
that we don't need the church, we don't need his people, we can kind of blow that off. Or, or those things like pride and arrogance, those things like desires, I should get to choose. God gave me the ability to choose, right? And when we talk about it like this, we kind of go, well, we know better than that. You know, if you say it out loud, it's something that you kind of, it starts to sound silly, right? Like, I'm on par with the God of the universe who with words through Jesus Christ created all of this. I'm on par with somebody who can forgive sin. I'm on par with the greatest wisdom in the world. When we say it, it sounds ridiculous. But as we live, our actions prove otherwise. It'd be like me saying, okay, let's say our friend Mr. Scott, Scott Alderink, who is a woodworker, friend of ours. Let's say Scott made this. I don't know if he did or not, but Scott's got tools, and he's a fine work worker. He can make this. Well, it's like me saying, oh, I got tools at home. I got a saw. I got a chisel. It's about that big, but I got a chisel and a saw. Easy, no problem. I, I could make this. But then you get into the heart of the matter. A couple of weeks ago, I did a plumbing job at home. And in my frustration at the end of the day that took four trips, one to, one to Lowe's and three to Menards, a little bit more money than I thought originally would plan, just to put in a little sink in vanity. And the final straw that just broke me was a soap dispenser. You know, one of those you screw in underneath and you pump. It will not go in. And I'm taking it out, I'm trying to refit it. Soap is now running down my arm. Do you think that's easy to turn? No, it won't turn. It's slipping out of my hand, and I'm just... And Don's like, what's wrong? I said, we should never, ever let me do projects in this house. I don't care what it costs. I don't care. Like, Bruce should be over here helping me with the plumbing. You know, I can't. This is not me. And then I look in, and I get even more mad because... The soap dispenser had a thread, so you thread the bottom in. Which side do you think I put the thread in? It's here in the top. So you don't want to, it's, ah! <laughs> but we start thinking it's all about ourselves. We think we're good enough to do that, and we start to think we can compete on God's level, and we can't. But we trap ourselves in this because we're unwilling to do what God created us to do. God created us to be created. We are not creator. We are created. And it shouldn't take much for us to look in the mirror and realize that. I'm not all powerful. I can't go anywhere, be anywhere, do anything like God can do. I'm not full of wisdom. Once in a blue moon. And it comes from him. But if we really start to look in the mirror, really start to look in our lives, really start to focus on what's important, we soon realize, oh, who should be in the driver's seat? Who should be the one that's in control? When we're the ones that don't take the time for self-reflection, when we're the ones that don't take what our faith is, when we don't rely on the Word of God, when we stop meeting in this, we get this, again, distorted view of us. It, that mirror becomes like more of the mirror in the funhouse. I don't know if you've ever been to Navy Pier, and there's a section in Navy Pier where you're walking through, and they've got all the weird mirrors. Some of those mirrors make me look good. That's a pretty amazing mirror. Or skinny. You know, but you go through that and we start getting this distorted view of what we look like and then we think we like it, right? We think we like or feel comfortable with the sin that we've cultivated in our lives because it's like, well, nobody's going to know. Who's going to know? Oh, they'll know because that spirit of God within us eventually will someday trigger some stuff that God still wants to be in charge and God still loves us enough that he, he's going to make, it's like eventually a zit comes to a head. 
but for a while we're living in the house of mirrors thinking we've got, got this made. We think we're our version of being faithful, our version of being godly, our version of this, that, and the other thing is a good thing. Uh-oh. It's not God's version. Even, even the most saintly of us. And some of us can think of people that they have walked long and wonderfully with Jesus. Even the most saintly version of us still isn't Jesus Christ. God uses us, wants us to be like that, but that's not who we are. So here's the danger in this kingdom, this lordship, this all about meanness that we create. And it's this. If people know that we follow Jesus Christ, if people are looking to us to be an example of Jesus Christ, and we're living in this little trapped cage of ourselves, but still putting out an image that's not godly, but people think might be godly, what are we doing? We're throwing up a false god. We're throwing up a false representation of Jesus Christ. We are throwing out an idol. If, if I'm in relationship with people that don't know Jesus, and I hate to admit the fact that there are days that this happens, and I'm using language or talking about certain topics or dealing in a certain way or not showing my faith in what I'm doing, I am presenting a false image of God, especially if that person doesn't know Jesus and doesn't have the knowledge to understand that the Word of God teaches us all the attributes of Christ and of God the Father and the Holy Spirit. And if I'm presenting a different gospel, what is that? It's death. And I don't want to overstate this, but I don't want to understate this. If we are presenting by word or deed a different gospel, a different message that comes in the Scripture, and people are looking at us and desiring to be Christ-like, and we are leading them down a false road, in some level, we're banishing them to hell, to darkness. Because if they're taking their cues of what a faithful follower of Jesus Christ is for me, and I'm kind of over here pretending I'm a faithful follower or believing I'm a faithful follower, but really kind of doing my own thing, if I'm not in submission to Jesus Christ, I'm not sending them down the path to everlasting salvation. I'm pointing them to eternal separation. That's serious. Because false gods lead to death. We see that all throughout Scripture, right? They worshipped Baal. They worshipped Dagon. They worshipped all these different gods. And it got them nowhere. It got them separated for eternity from God. So the responsibility for me as a Christ follower is to do what it says up there. Jesus didn't think equality with God was worth the mission that he had to complete. He had to be humble. He had to take a back seat. He had to be second fiddle. He had to be able to come down here and become like us. The God of the universe, who with a word could create anything, became a baby. The God of the universe, when people mocked him and spit him and hung him on a cross, who could have just thought to wipe them from the face of the earth so they and their relatives never existed, had to sit in a second place chair and say it's okay. The God of the universe who saw people hurt and were filthy and were untouchable, put out his hand and touched them and cared for them and loved them. He emptied himself. But how many times do we? Or do we say, I want my way? Or I think I know this. I think I got this. How many times do we want to play well with each other in churches? God is not replaceable. So let's stop thinking that we can be that. Or let's remember that we can't be that. Because some of this, a lot of this, winds up being we don't think about it. We don't move in that direction. You know what? I prayed last week. I'm good. Men's Bible study ended, you know, in March. And well, we'll get back to it in September. I'm good. I'm not doing time with God, whether it be devotionally, prayerfully, worshipfully, whatever it is. It's like, I, you know, I'm 
in, and that's good enough. I crossed the line. I don't know if this is clever or good, but I was thinking about this, and I wrote this. As people of the covenant, as people that God has called in this unique and wonderful and special relationship, the two-way street, the covenant that we as Reformed people for generations have loved because it, it gives us a wonderful place and it gives us a God that loves us and watches over us. As people of the covenant and God's chosen and holy people, if we are not following Christ's example in word and in deed and in thought, then we are missing God's plan and we are promoting a false God. And ladies and gentlemen, we don't make good gods. We don't. And it's easy to figure that out by glancing over our shoulders once in a while and realizing where you are, how you got there. There's a great question a friend of mine talked about um, who was a youth pastor out in California and, he, and he, he sits with a lot of students as they've come to him with issues in their life. And he'll listen to the issue, he'll sit down and just, he is a phenomenal listener. And just tell me, ask some great questions, but just no advice, just listen, listen. And they get to the end of where that person is and so where you are now, how did following God get you to the point where you're at? Well, 99 out of 100, 999 out of 1,000 times, following God didn't get you to where you were at, right? That's how we know we're not good God. What got us to this point wasn't being a good God. It was ignoring the good God. So his follow-up question is always, now, how do we follow God out of this situation? And that's the question as we look at this today. How do we follow God out of the situation that we've gotten ourselves into that thinking, we are a good God, that we are God, that we have the right and the authority to live as we want. We're not good gods because we take a short view. We can't see eternally. We see to the tip of our nose. Or we overplan and don't let God into those plans for our life and our future. We're favoritism. You know, it's like, hey, you know, this section of the church I like, that section of the church is marginal, this section of the church, I don't know, guys. You might get the scraps. Because we like playing, oh, you're nice to me. I don't know you. You're, we play favoritism. God doesn't. Self-interest. What about me? Thrives within all of humanity. What about all the isms out there in the world? Even though it's overblown right now, there are isms in this world. Racism, sexism, gender, whatever. They're all out there, and they all play a role in this, too. We don't make good gods, so let's stop trying. Because we have a good God. We have a God who loves us. We have a God who cares for us. This verse in Isaiah kind of made me think a little bit. Isaiah 2, 17 and 18. The arrogance of man will be brought low, and the pride of men humbled. The Lord alone will be exalted in that day. Isaiah 2, 17 and 18. The arrogance of man, people, us, all y'all, will be brought low, and the pride of humanity humbled. The Lord will be alone exalted in that day. So at the end, God and God alone will reign. God alone will be exalted. God and God alone will be the one that is above all and over all. Always has been, always will. But on that day, we'll go, oh yeah. What does it say in Scripture? Every knee shall bow and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Someday we'll be taking a knee. And will we be taking a knee because we have to? Because we want to or because we get to? What did we do up until that point? And here's the interesting thing about... If we can get rid of the baggage of me being God, of you being God, of, of, of us taking God's rightful place, then we can be more what God intended us to be. And I've told this to students many times. When Jesus went up into heaven, 
So Jesus gets taken up in the book of Acts. He goes back and I will be back someday. I'm going to prepare a place for you. In my house, there are many rooms. We sing it as kids. We know it as adults. So Jesus goes on up and the, the disciples are left. How many are left? Eleven. At that point, I, sorry, I should know this being a, a pastoral type, but they eventually got a twelfth, but I can't remember if it was before or after Jesus' ascension. I think it was after, but if you want to tell me afterwards I'm wrong, that's totally fine. Larry, am I right or wrong? I'm right? Okay, good, I'm right. But you had maybe a hundred confused people left, right? Because a lot of people had run away. The disciples were still kind of scratching their head going, what just happened over the last couple of years? But did Jesus leave a manual of church government? No. Was there the orange book of the Reformed Church in America's church order? No. Was there written scripture? Well, there was the Torah, there was the books of the Jewish scriptures, but there was no New Testament. It's like saying the people in World War II said, we're calling this World War II today, or World War I, they're calling it. No, there was nothing. Jesus left us. So the reason we don't need to be a good God, the reason we need to get out of this trapped environment is because we need to be able to be the next generation that passes on church. Jesus left a hundred confused people who were powered by the Holy Spirit to make sure the church would be here today on the 18th of July in 2021. The church of book order didn't get us here. I'm not saying it's a bad thing. The Reformed Church in America didn't make sure it got here. You and I, faithful followers of Jesus Christ, are the only reason there's anybody going to be sitting in this room 20, 30, 40, 50 years from now. That's why we need to get rid of the idols in our own life. That's why we need to break free from this cage together. Because if I'm playing God in my own life, I need a friend like Brent or a leader like Ashlyn or a buddy like Raj to say, Ty, wake up. Oh, I need to be that for my children. I need to be that for friends and others. We need to be that for each other or else the cage that we're trapped in stage a cage. The Christ that I promote becomes less Christ-like if I don't have Todd going, hey, Ty, how's your faith going? If Carrie's not asking Sanat, her daughter, how are you doing with Jesus? If the elders of this church aren't looking at the spiritual matters of this church, if we together aren't looking out for one another, if we aren't following the verse that says Christ emptied himself, then we're going to promote a false gospel and we're not going to be here 10, 15, 20. Surprisingly enough, we are God's plan for the world. Because Jesus already fulfilled what he was going to do, right? When were your sins forgiven? 2,000, give or take a few years ago, on the cross, on Golgotha. Jesus doesn't have to re-die every time we sin. That, that's done. The work of Jesus in salvation is done. Now it's the work of Jesus working through us, but we were God's plan. Apart from Jesus, again, I'm not trying to elevate us again. But we were what God left. We, in our brokenness, are part of God's plan. And the more us we are and the less Jesus we are, we've got a problem. The more Jesus we are, we don't have a problem. I hope I said that right. I don't think I did. Less us, more Jesus. More love, joy, peace, mercy, grace, patience, all those things that God's Word talks about, that are the attributes of God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, is what we need to be. For each other, to each other. This could be a two-parter. I'm not going to go more. We could spend a lot of time, and Pastor Mike's been doing a phenomenal job of talking about what it means 
that follow hard after Jesus. But my point today was to get us to see that's what we need to do. You are not a God. I am not a God. We are not gods. We are not kings and queens of our own domain. If we are followers of Jesus Christ, we need to be like Jesus. Humble. Servants. See us for what we really are. And really, it's pretty simple in concept. It's really hard in life. Get in the, get in the shotgun seat. Get in, you're not co-pilot. I'll take that back. Get in the driver's seat. But Jesus is the one who needs to tell us where to go, what to do, how to get there. He doesn't want us inactive. So that's why I just changed that. He doesn't want us inactive. We're not puppets. But if we're connected, if we're seeing ourselves for who we are, if we're looking in the mirror, then we're letting God be the one that says, hey, Ty, this is the way to go. Each of us need that connection. It can be as simple as get in the car. Jesus isn't my co-pilot. He's my navigator. He's the one that says, let's go. I got some adventures. You drive. I'll navigate, and we'll get there. Philippians 2, 12 through 15. Dear friends, you always followed my instructions when I was with you. And now that I'm away, it is even more important. Work hard to show the results of your salvation, obeying God with deep reverence and fear. For God is working in you, giving you the desire and the power to do what pleases Him. Do everything without complaining and arguing, so that no one can criticize you. Lean clean, live, ugh. live clean, innocent lives as children of God, shining like bright lights in a world full of crooked and perverse people. Amen. Lord, we spend a lifetime pursuing our interests, creating our little worlds, our little domains, our little kingdoms for nothing. Yep, you've called us to be in this world. You've called us to the work that we do, the lives that we have, the families that we are connected with, all the different things, Lord. But parallel to that, many times over and above that, we create the little beautiful cages that we are trapped in. Open our eyes. Transform our hearts. Guide our hands. And help us to be obedient. Through your power, Jesus Christ, and your Holy Spirit living within us. Amen. We have one song to finish with. We'll stand for the singing of I Surrender All.
may the Lord bless us with the inconvenience of our self-promotion, of our desire to be like him in ways that aren't like him. May God shake our worlds so that we will empty ourselves, join arm in arm together, and go and be his people, promoting the true and one gospel of the scripture and the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And all God's people said, Amen. Amen.